Hi guys, it's Professor Fernandez again, and this week we are starting to learn about poetry. Now, poetry can be difficult. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I'm going to take a little bit of my coffee to kind of explain poetry to you. So poetry um, is another way to tell a story. And what it is, is a heightened type of storytelling. Essays are probably the most direct type of storytelling. It's going to tell you the sky is blue. Fiction is another more direct way of storytelling, but it's more artsy. It's going to tell you that the sky um, was as blue and as deep and as cool as a marble, right? It's going to describe the sky for you and it's going to tell you the meaning of the sky. It's going to compare it to other things. Poetry, however, it's not going to compare the sky to you, uh, for you. It's not going to tell you that the sky is blue. It's going to say that the sky rains down meatballs, right? It's going to tell you um, the feeling and the motion of the sky. So I am use this example because Poetry can be difficult for students, especially if they've not had a really good foundation in poetry. And I have found through the years that students haven't had a really good foundation in poetry for some reason. So I'm gonna go through a couple of poems here, a couple of classic poems. These are not poems that I have assigned to you to read. Um, these are actually poems that are a little bit, these are American poems um, written by one by Emily Dickinson of which who I am kind of obsessed with now uh, after watching Dickinson on um, Apple Plus. And of course, another poet who I've always been impressed with and obsessed with, Edgar Allan Poe. So none of these have been assigned to you. So I'm, I'm picking poetry that is um, not modern at all. Um, so I want to go through these, kind of show you some things so that way you're able to look at poetry that I have assigned to you, um, which is a little bit more modern. Um, I find that talking about uh, poetry is a little bit more modern. It's a little bit easier to, um, to discuss for students um, because the experiences are a little bit more recent. Um, but Emily Dickinson and Edgar Allan Poe are eternal. So uh, let me do a quick share here. Um, share stuff from my iPad here. And we will talk some Emily Dickinson. All right. You should be seeing what's on my iPad right now. Um, this particular poem, Because I Could Not Stop for Death, um, is one of actually my favorites. Um, I'm basic, apparently, of Emily Dickinson's. I'm still going through uh, her uh, her poetry and learning more about her um, as the seasons unfold on the TV show Dickinson. So um, let's go through here, and I'm going to make this bigger so you can see here. Um, I'm going to just do an anatomy of a poem here. So when you see this, here and you see how this is almost like a paragraph these paragraph looking things these are called stanzas and these are like your basic units in poetry um this is how things are separated sometimes poets don't use stanzas they just run everything together and that's perfectly fine they'll use maybe another way of like organizing the poem. Um, they'll probably organize it by line breaks, of which I will talk about here in a second, um, or they'll do it by topic. But more than likely, usually, stanzas are used, right? So this is a stanza. So you may want to take notes and use the appropriate words in your journal, right? So don't just tell me, oh, they used a paragraph. There's no paragraph. This is a stanza. Now, I want you to look at how things are aligned here. This right here, this is a full left alignment. And this is on purpose, right? Um, let's go back a little bit. Every, everything you see on the page is on purpose. Um, there is no mistakes. You will see, compared to the other poem I'm about to show you, um, that the alignment can change, right? So Dickinson, or her editor, because 
the more I learned about Dickinson, she really didn't publish this. This was published after her death. Um, so they decided to align everything on the left-hand side and to capitalize the beginning of each line here. I want you to understand here what I just what I just said. This here is a line, it's not a sentence. Remember a sentence begins with a capital letter and ends with a period, right? Technically, this whole stanza is a sentence, right? But we really don't use sentences or say sentences um, in poetry. We save them for fiction, we save them for essays. Um, so this is a line. So every sentence here is a line. So these are lines. So you can see that every line here begins with a capital letter. Um, what does that mean? It just means they decided to capitalize this. It means it also means the beginning of a new thought. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that the thought ends with a paragraph here. Um, punctuation here or grammar used in poetry can mean its own thing. For example, she's using M dashes here, the continuation of a thought um, that's related. It's almost like a semicolon in this instance. Sometimes they don't use dashes or they use the dashes for other things. There is no universal use of grammar here. Poets will do what poets do and poets do whatever they want to do. So sometimes the M dash is a continuation of a thought. Other times the M dash um, is to pause a thought. Sometimes the M dash um, uh, is just there to pause the thought for the next line, which is what it's doing here. So um, it's up to you to realize what it's doing here. So there's stanzas, grammar can be used here and grammar, uh, the grammar rules, they kind of throw them out, <laughs> out the window sometimes. Um, for example, if you write, because I could not stop for death and you put a period at the end of that, that is not a sentence, that is a grammar, uh, that is a fragment and I will ding you for it, <laughs> all right? So, um, yeah, there you go. So you have this and then you also have, um, let me go to another stanza since I've written on that stanza. You also have here um, capitalization in the middle of lines here that aren't really grammar related. So for example, here the I, you always capitalize I when it's a word. So that's kind of a grammar related thing. Um, so I'm not really worried about that, but she is capitalizing, we slowly drove, he knew no haste. Um, so she's capitalizing this as, 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 as if it's a new thought. Um, you can almost take this out and make this a semicolon actually, because there, there are two lines that are related or two sentences that are related. So you can put a semicolon there, but the choice was an M dash or dash, not a semicolon. So um, that is an interesting choice, right? So whenever, something is capitalized in the middle like this, it's because these words are important to the um, poet for some reason, for some reason. Um, it's important that school is capitalized and children is capitalized, right? So you have these capitalization things. Another thing that I want to talk about here before I move on to Edgar Allan Poe, um, and Edgar also has this too, and let me erase this so you can actually see this. You have here um, two S sounds here. We pass the setting sun, actually three with the S's here, right? We pass the setting sun, and this is alliteration. Now we're getting into literary terms, right? Alliteration. Um, and alliteration is the same consonant sound, usually at the beginning of a sentence or beginning of a word, over uh, several words, right? So it's the S sound and we pass the setting sun. Um, the beginning, we pass the fields of the gray, of the gazing green. Gazing green right here is also alliteration. Right. Ooh. So this is here. These two are 
types of literary terms. There's tons of literary terms and I'll get into a couple of them here with the next, uh, with the next poem, which is one of my favorites, by the way. And so like with any story, there's a beginning, there's a middle and there's an end. And that's something you kind of want to also keep a lookout here, right? So I'm talk I just finished talking about literally the anatomy of a poem and we haven't even read the poem yet. So you know what a line is, you know what a stanza is, you know how grammar, they play loosey goosey with the grammar. You actually have one literary term that I told you because I can never pass by and pass an alliteration example. I also, I want to talk to you about beginning, middle, end. So we have this idea here of death because death, um, cause, because I could not stop for death, death kindly stopped for me or he kindly stopped for me. So we have death here and the image, here's another literary term of death being male and kind, right? And it's almost like she is um, in this particular poem in those particular lines almost like she's kind of like oh he's kind of cool like she's got a crush on him a little bit right so at the beginning we have this image of death this death being kind she's kind of crushing on death a little bit uh uh, uh what's up can I get your number whatever right so we have uh, we have this thing so we have we well, say we're reading through this we have kind of like the middle here and I'm going to say the middle is right about here. And we have this idea of passing um, and the idea of um, this, this carriage ride or this ride that they're going on together and the idea of, of passing um, children and schools and they're going through like a neighborhood or a town. So there's the idea of traveling and you also have the word passing here, which is interesting here because one passes through, passes to death. So passing even um, as a new definition. So that's the middle here. And so this is how she ends this poem. Since then, tis centuries and yet feel shorter than the day I first surmised that horses' heads were, were toward eternity. So here we have the end of a ride here. And she kind of misses him, right? Um, and kind of said, you know, it's been a while since I've seen my boo. Like, where be, where be he? Um, it's been a while. And like, it's been like eternity, <laughs> right? So you literally have a carriage ride from death, which is depicted very well, by the way, in Dickinson. If you haven't seen it, you should see it um, very well. And so you have a beginning, middle, end with a poem. And each poem has this because a poem tells a story. All right, I'm gonna get rid of this here, delete this PDF. And I am gonna do The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe, which is one of my favorites. Um, and I read every year, um, I read every year for, of course, um, Halloween. It's actually one of my favorites to read during Halloween. And if you've actually had me before, um, you pro I probably have posted The Raven or someone reading The Raven um, in, uh, in D12. So let's look at The Raven here. We're not gonna read through it. It's a really long poem. This is another way, another classic way of telling a story. Edgar Allan Poe, um, well, he wrote essays and short stories and poetry. He wrote it all. Um, weird guy, crazy guy, married his 13 year old cousin. I'm still trying to reconcile with that, but fantastic writer. All right, so let's go through it. Remember the vocabulary words I just gave you, right? So this right here is a stanza. See how this is a, br a break right here? This is a stanza. You see how this is here? This is a line, right? Talking about the anatomy of, of a poem. Um, now, Edgar Allan Poe does something different here that Emily Dickinson did not do. 
um, he rhymes, right? And so now we're talking about something called a rhyme scheme. Um, and whenever we talk about rhyme schemes, if you've never talked about rhyme schemes in another English class, when we talk about rhyme schemes, we're talking about labeling the rhyme and making sure that it it, and trying to understand and identifying the pattern of the rhyme scheme. There's different rhyme schemes um, and they're each rhyme scheme or not each, but several rhyme schemes have names to them. <laughs> Look, I don't know all the names to them. Well, I do know the names to them, but I'm not, I'm not gonna pretend that you need to know the names of the rhyme schemes. It's more important that you understand that there's a rhyme scheme and why that rhyme scheme is there. Maybe that is just the style of the day, which it is, ooh, sorry, which is which it is during Edgar Allan Poe's day, or um, they're playing with rhyme and there's a reason why they're playing with rhyme. Again, we're gonna study more modern poets and they use free form, more than likely use free form, it's very rare they use a rhyme scheme. So I'm going to read this first stanza to you so we can understand rhyme scheme. Um, and then I'm going to talk after rhyme scheme, I want to talk about something called line breaks. I mentioned it earlier, um, but I'm going to talk about it here because Dickinson didn't really have any interesting line breaks really, um, but Edgar Allan Poe does. So once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I noted nearly, while I nodded nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping as of, su as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Tis some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door, only this and nothing more. Okay, there's a rhyme scheme here, but I want to talk about line breaks because it's important to understand um, that there's some rhyme in the middle of these lines, but they're not at the end of the line. When you're looking at rhyme scheme, you want to look at the rhyme at the end of the lines, not necessarily in the middle of the line, right? For example, we have um, nearly napping, there suddenly came a tapping. Um, See this and this kind of rhyme, right? And so, but, but we're not looking at the rhyme here in the middle of the line. We're looking at the rhyme at the end of the line. Why are we doing that? Because of line breaks, right? Edgar, Mr. Poe, um, decided to break the line here. Remember what I said? Um, these aren't sentences. These are lines. Sentences begin with a capital letter and end with a period. And we see that here. Capital letter, period. This whole stanza is technically a sentence, right? It's technically grammatically a sentence. So he breaks the line or he breaks the sentence where he wants the rhyme to be. And that's a line break. They break it where the, they want the line to be, where they want the emphasis of the word to be, or where they want the emphasis of the image to be. So we have weary, and we're gonna label that A, right? We're gonna do letters because that's just how we do. Does weary line with rhyme with lore? No, it doesn't. It's a different sound. So we're gonna do B. Tapping, does tapping rhyme with weary, lore? No, it doesn't. New sound, C. We're going to label it C. Now, does door rhyme with weary, lore, or tapping? It rhymes with lore. So we're going to go back to B. That's the B sound here. Door, it's B. And nothing more, B. So we have here a pattern, A, B, C, B, B, B right? This is where he's breaking the line so that we understand, so that the rhyme is at the end. Now, remember how I said, talked about alignment on the left-hand side, right? This is not lined all the way to the left-hand side. It's almost centered. Um, he's breaking lines here, but he's also moving certain lines here and to the left, right? Just like in this particular stanza, this one starts here, it goes over this way, then you have these two that go in, this one that goes this way, and this one that goes all the way in, 
right? Let's look at this one. This one is lines here. This one goes this way. These two go this way. This goes this way. And this one's lined there. Oh my gosh, this almost looks like a pattern. So how a poet is putting this on the paper is also something you want to look at at poetry because they are almost like they're drawing with words sometimes, right? So you have the line breaks that breaks the line for emphasis on something. In this case, it is the rhyming at the end. So you have a rhyme scheme. Spoiler alert, this rhyme scheme goes through the rest of the poem. Um, a, A, B, C, B, 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 B. Um, in that, not particular sounds, but in that particular, there's gonna be one rhyme at the, at the beginning and a different rhyme at the end, right? And then you have the, um, have the uh, pattern here on the left-hand side, the left alignment, that's also a pattern as well. He's breaking, he's breaking the lines on the sound, but he's also starting this line in a pattern as well. Um, why is he doing that? Well, I don't know. <laughs> he can be doing that because that is of the age. Um, um, something that they've done at the age or so other patterns that have the same, other poems that have the same pattern or it's just easier to read. It just depends. Um, I don't know why. I don't know why. I just, I just enjoy. Okay. So um, what's important is to make sure that you see if there's a pattern that breaks though, then maybe he's changed the pattern in rhyme or changed the pattern in how it looks like. That's something you may want to talk about maybe in your journal or try to investigate why and how that plays with the social issue. Um, so that's kind of what's important here about poetry. I know it's, it's gone long. Uh, when, so you, once you get me starting to talk about literature, I don't stop, as you will well find out. Um, but pretty much that's what's going on here in, in poetry. And some really quick, very basic primer on poetry, what it does, what's, what's important, what to look for, especially grammatically, especially with rhyme uh, or not rhyme, um, and especially with what how it looks like on the page. Um, we can talk about imagery, of which this poem has many, many, many images. Um, this also talks about death in a weird type of way as well, because um, Lenore is dead, spoiler alert. Um, and um, just kind of the theme of what it, it's going on here. But those things like imagery, um, let me give you some literary terms to look at. Imagery, which means the images that pop in your mind as you read it or the images that they're trying to present there based on what they're using. Um, the word diction is important because what that means is the choice of words that the, the writer has used in the particular poem. This can also be used in fiction and in nonfiction as well. Um, of course, you have something called figurative language. And figurative language is something that you've probably already learned um, in many, many a English class. Things like personification is called figurative language. Personification means that you're giving something that is not a person or a human, human-like traits, like when the tree branches sway. Well, trees don't sway. They sway because the wind's blowing. Human sway. So you're giving them that effect of a human sway right? Um, you have simile, which is spelled like smile, but not really. Simile is comparing two things you think like or as. And um, we've, you've probably talked about this many times. It's not so much important that the simile is being used. What's important is the comparison that is doing, that is being um, applied here. Um, it's cousin called a metaphor which is, um, which is, does not use like or as, it's still a comparison. Um, poets tend to like metaphors a little bit better. Um, you have all that, you have hyperbole, which is extreme exaggeration. Um, we use hyperbole all the time. Oh my gosh, the fish that I caught was like this big. No, homie, it was this big, stop lying. So that's what hyperbole is. And th those are some of the like the big things that you need to know. Theme is also a motif. 
are also big things that you need to know. I'm going to leave you to figure those out yourselves here. Um, so those are some of the big uh, literary terms or figurative language that's being, that it's usually used universally by poets. I'm going to stop talking because I can talk about poems and writing all day. Um, let me know if you have any questions and I will see you in class. Bye.